Are you? Are we good? No. Okay. We've been sleeping in a lot of different places, and usually we don't figure out where we're going to stay on a given night until that afternoon. That means either finding a place to camp somewhere, or if we're lucky, meeting someone who has a couch we can sleep on. And that's how we met John Gunther. He hosted us for a night before we left New York. John's a computer programmer and traveling enthusiast, and Albert couldn't resist filming him in front of his map collection. So after dinner, we kick back into interview mode. Do it again. That was excellent. Mm, didn't sound real. <laughs> I'm John Gunther. I've, uh, I live here in Rosendale for the past 25 years. Grew up in Brooklyn, though, in the real world. And uh, I'm a traveler. I love traveling. My mind is always on the next trip. And when I moved into this place, which had a large, massive white wall, I was finally able to start doing something I've thought about for half of my life, which is decorating with maps. I have both hosted and traveled a lot. And uh, the the interactions are all valuable to me. Where cultural exchange, whether it's domestic or international, happens you know, every week. Could you talk a little bit about what the weather's like around here, typically? I mean, the weather? Where? Well, I mean, the new weather or the old weather? When I was a kid, when I was a kid, and I used to spend time in the Catskills um, a lot in the summer and, and sometimes in the winter because I developed local friends, it was not unusual at all at Easter time, you know, March or April, to have three or four feet of snow accumulated on the ground. And that was, that was what you expected by then. It was still cold, it was very snowy. You, you, you had a lot of, of buildup over the year. It, it didn't get, you didn't have many thaws in the winter. And in these last 25 years I've lived here, the pattern is totally different. Now whether that's climate change or a weather variation, nobody knows yet. I mean, climate, <laughs> climate is basically, the difference between climate and weather is that climate happens over more than one lifetime. So we're not qualified to judge. But here we've had you know, many winters in the past 10, 12, 15 years where um, the snow was not consistent. You would get snow and then it would thaw out. We've had Christmases, you know, Decembers, not just Christmases, but Decembers that were on the 40s and 50s for weeks at a time. So it's clear that, that at least in terms of one generation, the weather experience here is quite a bit different than it was. And again, I don't, I have, I'm, not, I'm not enough of a climatologist or enough of a scientist to say that this is a long-term trend or, or a hiccup. Clearly, the, the concentration of CO2 has gone up. That's a measurable factor. You know, you, there's, no, there's no doubt that the, that the atmospheric concentration of CO2 has gone up. There's no doubt that CO2 causes more, heat to be, more incoming heat to be retained. The, um, the fluorocarbons and methane are even more potent trappers of heat. So the, the, the fact that, that humans have changed the atmosphere in a way that makes things warmer is pretty much undisputable that what's, what's not known yet is to what extent will these changes have offsetting um, factors. You know, for example, if, and one of the things that, that is conjectured is if you have hotter weather and more precipitation, that means more clouds. Will the more clouds reflect enough light from the sun to offset some of the effect of the, of the, the greenhouse warming? So those things just aren't known yet. But more and more the data is looking like we're tipping over into, into a much hotter world. The, you know, the, the ice melting in the Antarctic, the, some of the major ice shelves, shelves that have broken off in, from Greenland and from the Antarctic, those are things that we have not seen in human history. It's clear that if, if sea level goes up by half a meter, you know, places like Bangladesh are going to be in major trouble because they're at sea level for you know, dozens of miles inland already. Um, you know, I go to Cape Hatteras once every few years and rent a house down there for a week. And you know, I tell my kids, we well, better come along because in another generation, the outer banks won't be there. So I think, you know, we don't know how bad it's going to be, but there are many people, especially the poorer ones, are going to suffer with climate change. And then there's a whole bunch of people, and you know, an enormous, surprisingly, amazingly large number, who just reject all that. That scientists are full of crap, that it's all a conspiracy to get money. We are a very polarized country in a, in a very disturbing way. I mean, I don't even, I barely even know any really conservative people. You know, it's not, it's distasteful. You know, you really can't be friends with people who have those extreme views. And as a result, we're gravitating into very polarized, isolated groups. 
and we now and and you know we now have media that that set us for that. I read the New York Times, you know the 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 people in the Midwest listen to Fox News, <laughs> and that that really reinforces that sense of isolation because we're not talking to each other. And so the challenge is figuring out how do we have a conversation in in that kind of environment. You know, it is a challenge, and so far we're failing. Those conversations are not happening very much. We have the country roughly divided 50-50 on these two very polarized camps. So I think what we need, and this is not something that's going to change in a week or a month, what we need is, is a real cross-cultural program where, we, where these people are thrown together. Now, there are programs where they put Israeli and Palestinian kids in, in summer camps together to learn about each other. And that doesn't mean that they're, they're, they're going to agree, but it does mean they understand more and they get influenced by the other side. The way I model this is that, that representative democracy, our, our style of you know, Congress and, and you know, elected by people who then represent certain segments, has been, was a great idea 200 years ago. It was very novel. But over 200 years, the people with, with proprietary interests and, and inevitably with money have learned to game that system. So now, at this point, after all this practice everybody's had, people with, with enough brains and enough money can pretty much get the outcome they want, even if it's not in the public interest. How do you think that relates to the climate change conversation? Same thing. I think the, inter the people who, who make money from the status quo, and I think that's where a lot of this comes from, is that the status quo people do not want to see change because it puts their fortunes at risk. They work hard to manipulate everybody else through skillful, psychologically based um, you know, advertising and publicity campaigns to believe something that's just, in many cases, clearly not true. With gasoline at, at three fifty a gallon or even four dollars a gallon, these alternative energy markets cannot possibly develop. No one can compete. No one can make solar power or wind power or anything new, you know, any new technology, when you're competing with energy at four dollars per gasoline gallon. So yeah, cl this you know climate change and 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 the the sort of failure of democracy, of of you know representative democracy are are you know they're topics that that we talk about a lot because the next generation, you know, your generation, my kids' generation, are gonna have to deal with some pretty serious effects. And you know, I, I build myself as a cheerful pessimist. You know, yes, I believe the world is going to hell, but I'm not gonna let it ruin my day. You know, I do what I can, but I'm not gonna sit here and slip my wrist because I think the world is doomed. But it's sort of unfortunate that that as human beings with all of this amazing technological innovation and 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 you know anthropological history where we've really changed from caveman days to, to now in a very short period of time, that we seem to have run out of the ability to address problems intelligently. And that's really sad.